It's not surprising that the audience is a bit smaller this week. Throughout January and February, a lot of people are traveling and on vacation. It's also not surprising, I find that when the weather system is changing, I found it hard to get out of bed this morning. How many of the rest of you found that as well? The change in temperature was nice, but the humidity, uh, it just um, often in those changes, it makes us want a nap before we even get out of bed. For myself, I'll admit that. Last Sunday, I shared a bit of an introduction to the book of James. I shared that James was a half-brother of Jesus, that he had a hard time understanding Jesus until after his death and his resurrection, his ascension, and the day of Pentecost. Something happened to James, and the doubt and the misunderstanding that he experienced while he was interacting with Jesus on earth suddenly became a revelation in his life. And something happens, and he becomes a leader in the church, an important presence in the city of Jerusalem for the Christian believers, and he dies for his faith. He is martyred, stoned to death, according to what we see in writings of that time. I also shared that he wrote this book to the Jewish believers, those who began to follow Jesus and had um, been scattered to other countries. He ri- writes in chapter, in verse 1, he writes to the 12 tribes, uh, a language used in Jewish, um, it's Jewish language, the 12 tribes, the different um, uh, 12 sons of um, forming Israel, and they are scattered. They have been pushed out of Jerusalem. They have been persecuted. They are running for their lives. They are refugees into the other countries and surrounding areas. And he writes to them with a sense of urgency, encouraging them to hang on to their faith, to not let go of God's promises, to know that their life matters even as refugees, even as those running. The purpose of the book is to encourage them, to remind them of how to live their life even if they're not in their normal settings, how to hang on to their faith even if persecuted. As I mentioned last week, James is written like Proverbs. It's a bunch of little bits and pieces of words of encouragement, words of wisdom, words of instruction, and they're all kind of stuck together. There's not this coherent, in Paul's letters we see this coherent kind of flow of the whole chapter by chapter. He builds on a theme. Um, James has themes in his writing as well, in his letter, but it's much more little nuggets. Here's something I thought, I'll throw it in. Here's something I thought, I'll throw it in, and it just builds. So it makes it a little bit difficult, as Nate and I were looking at it, it makes it a little bit difficult to know how do we handle um, all of the themes that he throws into his chapters, all that he's trying to say to the people. So I will be covering James 1, verses 1 to 18, Um, We don't have the text on the screen because it's a larger passage, so please pull out your Bible if you have it with you. If you don't have one with you, I'd encourage them, there's some out on the table in the foyer, to grab one. Last week, I encouraged you to bring your Bible and take notes, write, you know, underline things that stand out to you, put a question mark by things you want to think about a little bit more, but do grab a Bible. The next couple of weeks are going to be Bible text intensive. I'll give you time to do that. As we read through this book together, um, it's going to be important that we keep in mind what the context was for James as he's writing from Jerusalem and to the people that are receiving this letter. Um, And it's important to think about how does it compare to our setting? And what are the things that we're experiencing in our life that James is writing about 2,000 years ago but that we, as human beings, experience no matter where we are and how we're doing life and our current context. There are strong similarities. So if you can, turn to James. It's almost to the end of the New Testament. I'll be reading from James 1, starting at verse 1, and reading through verse 18. We'll go back and look at these verses in smaller segments, but I think it's good to read through it the first time all together. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. 
Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Um, Earlier this week... um, Nate and I were in touch with each other, coordinating the text and the songs, and and Nate made this comment to me of, I guess you're going to be talking about trials and temptations, huh? He was texting. I read this text, and I kind of gulped, and I'm like, I really don't want to talk about trials and temptations, you know? I really don't want them in my life, and I really don't want to talk about them. Does anyone else, like, if I say, today we're going to talk about trials and temptations, what do you think? Oh, yippee, right? (laughs) And so I think it's important before we jump into that section of these verses that we focus on the very end of this section, that we get perspective into um, the context. How do I deal with trials and temptations if I don't have a bigger framework, if I don't have a bigger context, if I don't have the, the big picture that helps me to deal with the little things that get started? So in looking at verse 17 and 18, I want to look at who is this God that we are in relationship with and who are we as we're in relationship with him. I made the mistake of closing my Bible. My apologies. Verses 17 and 18 give us that framework. Seventeen and eighteen say, "Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all He created. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth." When we look at these verses, I think there are several things that we can see about God, and they're important frame references for us for all of life. If I'm going to walk through life, if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, if I'm going to be faithful through the difficult times as well as through the celebratory times, I need to understand who he is. And these verses give us, I think, three different areas that we can think about. He is the giver of all good and perfect gifts. We just celebrated Christmas. And I don't know about your families, your individual practices, but um, I come from a culture, and I see it in the Uruguayan culture, I see it kind of as an international thing now, that Christmas time has become a gift-giving time. We give gifts. And for children, we talk about Santa Claus, and we talk about Santa Claus bringing gifts. It's a gift-giving season. So what does it mean that God is a giver of all good and perfect gifts? What does it mean for us to understand our Heavenly Father as someone who cares about us, who walks with us, and who gives us good gifts? What are those good gifts? I think we think often of objects that we can unwrap. (laughs) I think in the spiritual sense, good gifts are much more than that. They are our character. 
They are our testimony. They are, are our impact in the world. They are our ability to walk in relationship with him and to walk in relationship with each other in a way that brings life, abundant life on earth and eternal life to come. God is a giver of all good and perfect gifts. It also says that he doesn't, he's not shifting sand. He is consistent and constant. God is consistent and constant. He does not change. He's not wishy-washy. I don't know if you've ever had to deal with in a relationship or on a job setting somebody who was wishy-washy, someone who you never knew what they wanted from you and you tried to do one thing and it wasn't the right thing and you just, it, it leaves you in an ambivalent relationship. It leaves you not being able to trust. It leads you not being able to know what to do next. What do I do here because I don't know what this person wants? That's not God. God is consistent and he is constant. He does not change. Yesterday, today, forever, he is there. And then he chose us. He chose us. He gives us birth, he redeems us, he transforms us, he gives us forgiveness, and he invites us as a part of his family. Not as stepchildren, not as half-children, but as his children in his family. He chooses us. This is God. And as we look at these things, it also means then that we are chosen by him, we receive his gifts, and we are his first fruits. First fruits is an odd term for us who maybe if you haven't grown up in an agricultural setting or in the, the Jewish Old Testament sacrificial setting, first fruits was the very best first of the crop, the very best, and it was brought to God and offered to God and it was set apart for him. And he was honored and glorified in those first fruits. So in this text, it's hard to know exactly what James is meaning by this, but we are a kind of first fruits that the chosen, as we walk with him, as we live in relationship with him, we're not second best. None of us are, but as we choose to walk with him, we become, as we live out our relationship with him, first fruits, something glorious that's beyond us, it doesn't rest on us, but it's his gift to us, that we might be first fruits of all he's created. With this perspective in mind, let's go back to the beginning of this chapter. Understanding this about God, this, his consistency, his good gifts, his choosing us, how do we walk through life? What does James have to say to his comrades, his friends, family members that are now scattered, that are now refugees? In verse 2 and 4, 2 through 4, James talks with them about trials, and they were experiencing very real trials. They had lost their homes, they had left everything, they were dislocated, um, I'm not sure if that's the right English term to use, but they're, they're misplaced and they're trying to live their life and they know that they are kind of an undesirable people. They were followers of Jesus, they're seen as rebels within the Roman Empire, within the Jewish faith, and they are in fear for their lives. Stephen has been martyred already, some of them are being carried off and arrested. They know they're kind of in a very dangerous place. And so James writes to them. It's hard to handle difficulties if we feel like we're alone. And it's hard to handle difficulties if we don't know how it's going to end. But God invites us and James invites us to understand that the trials that we face can actually form our character, can actually help us to become more like Jesus, can actually in increase and spread his kingdom on earth. Verses 2 through 4 say this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. 
Do we endure simply to endure? Um, some of you might be into physical fitness and training, extreme sports. Some of you I know are into martial arts, and you learn to endure um, for a purpose. I, Bob, I wanted to talk with you before today, but I'd love to hear what makes you endure what you endure when you go to training every week. Um, you know, for others of you, as well, what makes you endure? Is it just to endure, or is there a goal in it? Is there something that you're persevering through it for? When we face the trials with perseverance, we know that we are becoming mature. That's what James is saying. The trials aren't there to break us, they're to help us, to grow us. How do we embrace that? I think I grew up in a generation that wants life to be like a luxury cruise, but in reality, it's much more like boot camp. I want life to be easy. <laughs> I want to sit by a pool and drink some iced tea and watch the sunset. I, and, and you see our culture thrives on that as well. A lot of medicine has developed because, and rightfully so, but because we don't like to endure pain. We don't want discomfort. We want life to be comfortable. And trials counteract all of that. Trials challenge that. Life is more like boot camp and who are we going to be at the end of it than like a luxury cruise on a cruise ship? Do we expect it to be hard? Do we anticipate that it's going to be hard? Or are we caught by surprise when the hard times come? Are we caught by surprise when we are face to face with living in a broken world and the realities that that brings into our lives? What do I do when I think I've signed up for a cruise ship <laughs> and I landed in boot camp instead. What do I turn to? And who do I turn to? And James is saying, keep your eye on Jesus. Persevere. Hang on to your faith. Don't walk away from it in the middle of it. Don't endure just to endure to be a tough guy, but know that your maturity matters. Your character matters, and who you are becoming is more important than whether you get to sip the iced tea by the pool, is what I hear God say to me. The Christians in those days were facing life and death situations, things totally out of their control. I don't know that any of us or many of us have experienced that kind of um, situation. The challenges that we face, though, are still just as real and just as difficult, just as stretching as they experienced, but perhaps in a different context. And trials stir a variety of emotions in us. If they stir fear. What if my life isn't going to end up the way I wanted it to be? What if this illness could be the death of me? What if the loss of that family member, how do I live life without them? Fear. It stirs up anger. How could this happen? And why me? And Blaming other people, it stirs up a sense of self-pity. Why me? It stirs up envy. How can that other person be blessed and I have to go through this? How can it seem that that other person has it so easy and I have this? And then in the end, there's a sense of confusion. Those emotions are very real. And James isn't asking the people he's writing to to ignore them but he is asking them to hang on to their faith in the midst of it. We can use the challenges to grow into the person that God is calling us to be, to live as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, to take a positive stance, to learn, to mature, to grow, to let character form us. I grew up uh, in a family where um, my parents both grew up on farms, and they had lived on the farms during the Depression, through World War II, um, all of that. They have stories to tell. Um, my mother and father will always tell me how they walked a mile to a one-room schoolhouse that was warmed by a fire in a kettle stove, and, um, and whenever we would whine and complain, they would tell us about these hard times. Well, all, well they, didn't even, they didn't see them as hard times. It was just life. And I look back at my parents and I think they never, they, I did not, I cannot tell you a time that I heard my parents complain. Life was, they expected life to have its challenges. 
And they expected to go through those difficulties, and they weren't surprised by them. They weren't startled by them. I, my mother is one of the biggest people that I know that does not know self-pity. I never see my mother pity herself. Um, and I've lived with her for periods of my adult life. I should have seen it by now if it was there. I don't think it's in her. How is that possible? How is that possible to say, I understand that life has its ups and downs, and I understand that God is with me in all of it, and I lean on him? When I was home a couple of months ago, well, actually the other year now, I was talking with my aunt, and, and I was asking her about what was it like to grow up on the farm, and, and she goes, you know, we used to love when grandma, when her mother, my grandmother, would go out in the fields with them. She was... It was a family of seven kids, so my grandmother had to be in the house often cleaning and cooking and doing all of that work. And my aunt said, we used to love when my mom would come out with us in the fields because she made it fun. <laughs> she made it fun. How did she make it fun? She said, well, when Dad, when we'd be out working in the fields with Dad, we just had to get the job done. So it was hard work. But when Grandma came out, when, you, when, when my grandmother would go out with them, she would tell stories, she would sing, she, would, she made it fun. The hard work was an enjoyable experience. And I thought, isn't that an important characteristic that I hope to have in life? That even if it's hard work sometimes, even in the challenges and the trials, what does it mean to still be able to sing? sing to still be able to know joy? James writes, consider it pure joy. Pure joy? Yeah. Because this is only a part of life. It's not all of life, and it's not the end of the story. So can, consider it Joy, cheer each other on. Go out to the field singing. What an incredible story. I wish those kinds of traits could be passed on through DNA. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> I wish that my parents' and, and grandmothers' attitude in life I could have just inherited. Um, instead, I get to develop it. In verses 5 to 8, he talks about uh, wisdom. If you lack wisdom, and I think this comes naturally out of the idea of trials. If we're facing trials, then we need wisdom. We need to know how to act and what action to take and what attitude to carry. So he's saying, if you lack wisdom, ask God. If you don't know what to do, if you're confused, if you're feeling hurt, ask God to speak into the situation to tell you what to do. And God will give it to you. God will give you the direction, the wisdom, the thoughts to carry, the perspective. He'll remind you to look up. We read Psalm 121 at the beginning of our service. I look to the mountains. Where does my help come from? It's an image of looking to God, raising my eyes above my own issues, and saying, God, where are you? Walk with me in this. Give me the wisdom. And don't doubt that God will guide you in it. Don't be like the waves of the sea, blown around like the wind, tossed to and fro. Ask God for wisdom and walk in it. Wisdom helps us to know how to respond in the middle of the trials and challenges. Ask, and he will give it generously, James says. And then he goes into verse 9 through 11 talking about the brother in humble circumstances and the rich brother and how it all passes away. And um, it's a very kind of a picturesque, I, that's not the term I want to use, but like his imagery in all of that is kind of like, well, what's he really trying to say? What does he mean by all of this? And I think in verses 9 to 11, he's talking about equality. He's saying, whether you're poor, know that you're still blessed. Whether you're rich, Know that it's not your riches that make you blessed. They'll disappear one day, but it's being in God's kingdom. You're equal, whether you're poor or rich in the kingdom of God, you're equal. What matters to God is their relationship with him, their faith in him, their relationship with each other. In one of the books that I read in preparation for today, I read this statement. I thought it was so good. Christian faith obliterates class and social distinctions. In much of Paul's writing, he says, there is no longer Jew and Gentile. There's no longer male or female. There's no longer slave or free. Um, we are one in the body of Christ. And in light of recent events this past week and things that are flying around the Internet because of it, 
I find it important to just state, I look at all of you and we are equal. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And nobody's background, nobody's nationality, nobody's education, nobody's employment status matters in the kingdom of God. We are equal. I might be named as pastor right now, but that doesn't make me any better or more important than anyone else in the rest of the congregation. All of the things that we like in human standards to use to label each other and put each other in boxes, they do not exist in the kingdom of God. It makes us family. We are all adopted by God. And I feel it important to state that. There is no favoritism. There is no judgment. We are equal. Another word that shows up in verse 12, again, is this idea of perseverance. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And this verse is set up like the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, if you think of how Matthew records the Jesus message to the people that had gathered on the mountainside to hear Jesus. And the first verses in Matthew 5 are all this, blessed is the, for they will, blessed is, for they will. And it's a beautiful turning upside down the things that the world would say are important. So here James says, Blessed is the man who perseveres, because he will, when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, this promise of God to all those who love him. Crown of life, what does that mean? I, I, we don't know for sure what James is referring to, but as Christians we have this concept of eternal life and the crown that comes after this life has ended, but there's also Jesus' teachings about abundant life, that he has come that we might have abundant life and have life to the full, and that's a very present concept. So this crown of life, when we are enduring and persevering under trial, there's this abundant life that somehow shows up even in the midst of it, and this promise of all that we long for in an eternal life as well. Perseverance is a key word for James. In verses 13 to 16, he talks about being tempted and how our temptations come from our own evil desires and those evil desires drag us into sin and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Um, In the English language, we often like to say, oh, the devil made me do it. I don't know if there's an interpretation into Spanish for that or not. Oh, the devil made me do it. And, and James is here saying, nah, that doesn't, that doesn't fly. <laughs> um, yes, maybe there's an external temptation, but it becomes an internal desire, and you make the decision and you go for it. Um, sometimes it's an internal temptation, and we go for it. But either way, James is saying, you're responsible for your actions You're responsible for what you meditate on. You're responsible for the decisions that you make. Yes, external things can impact you, but ultimately, that decision that you make, that's a responsibility that we carry. And God isn't the responsible party either when it's a temptation that's coming at us. James is clear that it's not God who's throwing these things. Yes, he wants to see how we react. Yes, he wants to help us to react in a healthy way. But ultimately, that decision is ours. He doesn't control it, and, and he doesn't manipulate us in the process of that. God doesn't tempt anyone. Our evil desires catch us up, and they are something that are inside of us that we make choices about. Knowingly or unknowingly, they're there. Self-discipline is an important part of no longer giving in to those desires. There's no magic wand to say, oh, God, just take it away from me. Sometimes, ma- some, I shouldn't say magically, sometimes supernaturally he does intervene, but most of the time he says, I want you to learn to walk. How did your children learn to wa- walk? <laughs> you just picked them up and set them down and they took off, or they struggled and they built their strength and they took one step after the other. And James is saying that's kind of this process. our sense of responsibility, our need to develop discipline to walk through the temptations and trials that come at us. 
And then we're back at the end at verses 17 through 18. We are chosen. God is unwavering. He does not change. He isn't tossed about. He's not fickle. And he sets us apart. And the trials and the temptations and the struggles and the difficulties, he walks with us in them. I think that's the most significant thing for me as I read through James. James was in the middle of it with them. He wasn't standing on the side. James wasn't writing to people in boot camp from the luxury liner, the luxury cruise liner. He was experiencing the very same things that they were, and he eventually gave his life. And so he's encouraging them from being alongside of them, from saying, I understand, I get it, but don't give up. There's too much at stake. Don't bail now. It will be worth it, and God is with you. And keep your eyes fixed. As we were singing one of the songs during the worship session, I had to think, Jesus was alongside of us too. Jesus didn't, doesn't speak to us. God doesn't speak to us from a cruise ship. Jesus went through boot camp just like us. Every trial, every struggle to death. He's lived it. So we're not talking about a God who is aloof and aloft and distant. We're talking about a God who is real and present and, and walking with us through it all. Consider it pure joy. Be mature and complete. James served as a role model to the people he wrote to. Jesus served as a role model to James. And all of them are role models for us. Paul also was a role model in this way. If you read about Paul's life and all of his letters and the ways that things that he went through, man, I, I would not have signed up to be an apostle in those days. I guess they didn't either. God chose them, right? But we chose a text this year as our text for the year from Philippians, a letter that Paul wrote to the church, the believers that were forming in Philippi. We shared this verse last Sunday. It's one that we'll come back to periodically throughout the year. But Paul wrote to them saying, not that I've already obtained it all, or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So these words are the words that I'd like you to remember from the book of James, from this chapter one. Maturity, wisdom, equality, perseverance, responsibility, and chosen. Those are the ways that we walk through the challenges, the temptations, the realities of the difficult moments in our lives. And we can know that we are not alone. Jesus has walked through them all before us, and he walks through them all with us. And God's promise and God's consistency and God's power go with us as well. Let me close in a prayer. God, thank you. We'd rather not be in boot camp, if we're honest. If I'm honest, I'll speak for myself. I have bought into the delusion that life should be a luxury liner, a cruise ship. And that is not your word to us. It is ultimately your desire for us. But our character, our choices the transformation you want to do within us and the impact that we have on the world as we walk with you is important. And I thank you that you promise to be with us and that you promise us a life abundant here and now and that there is this reality of a, of a life that goes beyond this where every tear will be dried 
and where joy will be known to its full. But thank you that you give us joy here, that we cheer each other on and we walk with each other and we don't give up hope because you are the light of the world and you are the light in our life. And we place our hope in you. We give you this glory. We give you this thanks. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.